NPR's new CEO gets exposed as a woke extremist, Elizabeth Warren goes on a delusional rant on Twitter, and a TikToker explains why he can't be drafted for World War III. All this and so much more is coming up on today's episode of Brad vs. Everyone, my new daily series where I cover the craziest things in our politics and on the internet from a center-right, independent perspective. Don't forget to subscribe and stick around if you're new here, and regardless, hit that like button and comment with your thoughts as we go along, and I'll read a couple comments at the end of today's episode that you guys left on yesterday's video. Now, without further ado, let's check in on NPR, National Public Radio, because their new CEO has been exposed as not the most normal person in terms of her politics. So her name is Catherine Marr, and she has a very prestigious resume, having worked at UNICEF, the Atlantic Council, the World Economic Forum, the State Department, Stanford, and Wikimedia Foundation, which publishes Wikipedia. And as of last month, she is the CEO of NPR. But Chris Rufo, a conservative activist affiliated with the Manhattan Institute, has documented the new NPR CEO's radicalism in an article that he <laughs> hilariously entitled, Quotations from Chairman Marr. This is a riff on Chairman Mao the uh, communist dictator in China. Rufo dug into the new NPR CEO's long history, her Twitter comments, remarks she's made, and the picture that he painted is of somebody who is breathtakingly radical and seemingly has embraced every woke buzzword and movement and activist fad imaginable. She has tweets decrying her own, quote, cis white mobility privilege, as well as tweets lamenting, quote, late stage capitalism, using the term, folks, F-O-L-X, which is gender neutral for folks, railing about, quote, toxic masculinity, and interestingly, bemoaning about how white airport lounges are. Rufo also highlights that Marr has an open record of partisan activism and a very clearly stated and openly touted bias in favor of one side. Rufo reports that Meyer was publicly excited about Elizabeth Warren in 2012. She said publicly she just couldn't wait to vote for Hillary in 2016. She says she once had a dream about sampling and comparing nuts and baklava on roadside stands with Kamala Harris. She, quote, worked to get out the vote in Arizona for Joe Biden, but slightly be resented being called a Biden supporter because for her, it was simply a matter of being a, quote, supporter of human rights, dignity and justice. And on the public record, she described Donald Trump as a, quote, deranged racist sociopath. Of course, all Americans have a right to their own political opinions, and you and I might disagree with everything she said there, but she's certainly entitled to hold that opinion. But how can you hold an opinion like that and be the CEO of a supposedly nonpartisan news institution that's supposed to cover elections and candidates and the parties fairly when your bias is so virulent and open, especially when that news outlet is a taxpayer-funded one? Perhaps even more disturbingly, Rufo's brought to light comments that Marr has made about how she views the First Amendment as a, quote, challenge to the mission of a news organization. The number one challenge here that we, we see in, is, of course, the First Amendment in the United States pro, is a fairly robust um, right, uh, protection of rights. And, and that is a protection of rights both for platforms, which I actually think is very important that platforms have those rights to be able to regulate what kind of content they want on their sites. But it also means that it, it is a little bit tricky to really address some of the real challenges of where does bad information come from and sort of the influence peddlers who have made a real market economy around it. She also apparently doesn't really believe that truth is a thing or a real concept. Take a listen. Clearly, the search for the truth has led us to do great things, to learn great things. But I think if I were to really ask you to think about this, one of the things that we could all acknowledge is that part of the reason we have such glorious chronicles to the human experience and all forms of culture is because we acknowledge there are many different truths. And so in the spirit of that, I'm certain that the truth exists for you and probably for the person sitting next to you. But this may not be the same truth. This is because the truth of the matter is very often for many people what happens when we merge facts about the world with our beliefs about the world. So we all have different truths. They're based on things like where we come from, how we were raised, and how other people perceive us. So to recap, 
We have the new NPR CEO who uses every woke buzzword in the book, thinks truth isn't real, views the First Amendment as a challenge, and has open partisan bias displayed in a very long and very public history. I'm sorry, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that maybe this person shouldn't be the CEO of a public media outlet. And while it is true that the CEO role at NPR is a fundraising role more than anything else, and she's not directly involved in overseeing the newsroom, to have such partisan ideologues in senior leadership at a ostensibly nonpartisan journalistic institution just totally annihilates their credibility, just lights it on fire with the American people. Now, I do want to address the criticism that's being made of, of many of the people who are kind of piling on Marr, saying that we're engaged in cancel culture. I think if she'd been appointed to some job in a private company and we were just trying to cancel her and get her fired because she had tweeted woke stuff or, or said nasty things about Trump, I think that'd be a fair critique. But it's different when she's in a senior leadership position at a journalistic institution and we're pointing out statements that directly undermine her ability to do her job. It's not digging up stuff from 20 years ago to try to cancel someone that's totally unrelated to their work. And it's also different because NPR receives a significant significant amount of taxpayer funding. And we'll get into the details of that because I know what you're about to say, oh, they only get 1%. It's a lot more complicated than that. And because they receive taxpayer funding, the public absolutely has a right to chime in on who should be in leadership positions at NPR. If they were fully private, not getting money from the taxpayer, then yeah, I would say I wouldn't be out here trying to get somebody removed as their leadership. I would say they're, they can do what they want and we just don't have to trust them. But when it's someplace that's receiving millions and millions and millions of taxpayer dollars, albeit indirectly, yeah. We get to have input, and that's not cancel culture. So this expose of Mars antics and beliefs, as well as a whistleblower report that we covered on the show where an insider at NPR spoke and revealed details about the network's extreme bias and the way that they've really warped into an ideological newsroom, all of this is leading to a renewed push in Congress to defund NPR. Congressman Jim Banks announced on Thursday that he'll be introducing legislation to revoke NPR's funding. Now, the common retort that you hear and that NPR claims on its website is that it only receives about 1% of its funding directly from the federal government. So they argue it's basically not funded by taxpayers. It's largely funded by corporate sponsors and private donors, which, okay, in that case, you should be fine with defunding it then. If you barely rely on taxpayer money, why not just get rid of it? Of course, they strenuously object to this notion of defunding NPR because it actually does get quite a bit of taxpayer funding. It's just a little bit indirect. So as an article in The Hill explains, NPR may receive little direct federal funding, but a good deal of its budget comprises federal funds that flow to it indirectly by federal law. Here's how it works. Under the terms of the 1967 Public Broadcasting Act, funds are allocated annually to a non-governmental agency, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is overseen by a board of presidential appointees. That corporation, in turn, can choose to support original programming produced by public television or public radio, but by law must direct much of its $445 million in funding to local public television and public radio stations across the country via so-called community service grants. So basically, the federal government gives huge amounts of money to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which then gives it to a bunch of local affiliates of public radio stations and public TV stations. And then they give it to NPR to broadcast their content. The Hill continues, here's where things get tricky. Local stations, if they want to broadcast all things considered, fresh air and other programming produced by NPR or competitors such as American Public Radio, must pay for it. Indeed, in its consolidated financial statement from 2021, NPR reported $90 million in revenue from, quote, contracts from customers, a significant portion of its $279 million and much more than 1%. Such revenue was exceeded only by corporate sponsorships, which totaled $121 million. One can think of these funds as federal grants that have been sent from Washington but returned to it. So that's the thing. They do get a whole lot of federal funding just indirectly. And I think that that's wrong. 
I'm honestly just against the idea of government media or government funding media at all. I think we should have a, a clear separation of government and press, but especially taxpayers shouldn't be forced to fund journalistic institutions that aren't neutral, that do have sharp ideological bias, and that have people who are openly partisan and extreme in an ideological fashion at senior levels of their leadership. So I fully support the push to defund NPR, which, to be clear, doesn't mean that NPR will have to stop existing. They'll just simply need to get more funding from all the liberal donors out there who love NPR and want it to continue existing. That really doesn't seem like something that will be that hard to do, and it makes a lot more sense for NPR to be funded by the people that like NPR than for it to be forcibly funded indirectly by taxpayers who don't support it and in fact are deeply repulsed by a lot of what it does. But what do you guys think? I'm curious for all of your thoughts. Do you support defunding NPR or do you still cling to liking some of the shows and wanting them to get some taxpayer dollars? Let me know in the comments and don't forget to hit that like button while you're at it. Up next, it's time for Delulu Epidemic, where I call out somebody who stepped in it and is showing they're stupid. Today in the Delulu Spotlight, we've got Senator Elizabeth Warren, the progressive from my home state of Massachusetts, who's put her Delulu on full display with this rant she just posted against the iPhone and against Apple. Warren tweeted, it's time to break up Apple's smartphone monopoly. Also, come on, let's stop leaving green text people out of the group chats. It's just not right. And she attached the following video. Green text on iPhones, they're ruining relationships. That's right. Non-iPhone users everywhere are being excluded from group texts, from sports teams chats to birthday chats oh to God. vacation plan chats. They're getting cut out, missing out on plans and conversations. And who's to blame here? Apple. That's just one of the dirty tactics that Apple uses to keep a stranglehold on the smartphone market. Apple has used its monopoly on smartphones to lock Americans into services and amass billions of dollars in profits. Apple even takes a cut every time you use tap to pay and has blocked a new app that would have let Android users finally use iMessage and get those blue texts. That's why last month, the Department of Justice sued Apple for its broad-based exclusionary conduct. And that's the right thing to do. It's time to break up Apple's monopoly now. Oh, there's so much here. Lizzie, Pocahontas, baby girl. Of all the things in the world, inflation, wars overseas, the economy, the border crisis, so many things going on. You're pressed about green text bubbles. I mean, I do think it would be annoying to be excluded from a group chat, and I know that does happen, but she's just like radically overstating the significance of this, as if the color of text messages is really driving families apart. Come on, give me a break, Pocahontas. Give me a break. Especially because there's actually a good reason to have a difference in the colors between the green text and the blue texts. The blue texts are sent from iPhone to iPhone over Wi-Fi, and they are incredibly encrypted. The green texts are not encrypted and are sent over SMS, which is notoriously vulnerable to hacking. So the distinction actually exists for a reason. Of course, this all comes in the context of the antitrust lawsuit that Elizabeth Warren mentioned, where the federal government is actually looking into breaking up Apple, one of the most popular companies in America, over things like its use of green text to differentiate between texts from Androids and texts from other iPhones. It's absurd. It's ludicrous. It's a complete overreach by the federal government to micromanage businesses that Americans are super happy with, actually, and they should be focusing on real problems like securing our southern border, for goodness sake. Also, and I don't know how many times I have to repeat this before it sinks into their thick skulls, the iPhone does not have a monopoly on cell phones. They've got about 60% of the American market, meaning that 40% of phones in this country don't have iOS, aren't Apple phones. There are multiple options to choose from, and many people choose options other than an iPhone. It's not a monopoly. Words have definitions. Words have meanings. The dictionary is not a choose-your-own-adventure game. For all these reasons, today, Senator Warren, Pocahontas, your Delulu is showing.
All right, guys, let me know in the comments what you think about this weird federal government war on the iPhone, and if you think Elizabeth Warren is Delulu. Now, up next, it's time for Brad versus TikTok, my segment where I react to the craziest and cringiest things going viral on the clock app. TikTok has been freaking out with everything that's going on in the world, worried about a World War III, and a lot of them are posting videos, some serious, some more tongue in cheek, about why they don't want to be drafted and why they don't want to fight in World War III. We're going to take Take a look at one of those videos that kind of hilariously explains why this TikToker doesn't want to go to war. Reasons why I can't go to war. Number one, I get nervous. <laughs> I get kind of nervous sometimes my hands get sweaty, so I don't even think I'd be able to throw anything without it slipping. Like if I threw a grenade, it would probably just land at my feet. I'd be like, oh, <laughs> um, number two. I wouldn't know anybody there and I have social anxiety, so that's a hard pass for me if I get drafted. <laughs> and also like I don't think I can have Celsius on the battlefield. Oh I don't think gosh. they'd allow that. So I, I think I'm going to have to sit this war out. So y'all have fun, though. Keep me updated. <laughs> So a lot of people were outraged in the comments being like, we're doomed or, oh my God, Gen Z is so ridiculous or God help our nation or blah, blah, blah. And I think those people need to take a chill pill. This is obviously meant tongue in cheek. And frankly, it's kind of hilarious. I really lost it when he said, I have social anxiety. I won't know anybody there. I mean, look, if we ever were in a World War III situation where we needed a draft and we needed Gen Z to save us, I fully acknowledge we would be screwed. That's never going to happen. One, I don't think there's going to be that war. But even if there was, we wouldn't have a draft ever again. The draft is immoral, and it's also not really the way that modern warfare is fought. World War III would happen mostly over cyber warfare and unfortunately, potentially through missiles flying, it wouldn't be a massive ground war where you just need raw ranks of recruits. Now, you need highly specialized people, which is what the military currently has in its all-volunteer basis. So Gen Z doesn't actually need to worry about being drafted in World War III anytime soon. But the content they keep making about it is hilarious, and this TikToker did drop a part two. Reasons why I can't go to war, part two. Number one is I'm not that good at following instructions, okay? Whenever people tell me to do something, I never do it. Relatable. My chief of command could be like, go left, go left. And my dumb ass would go right because, you know, we all know lefts and rights are very hard sometimes. I would get myself unalived. Number two, I kind of get greedy and I would try and steal all the kills because like, you oh. know, in Fortnite, I got I got something to prove. I would try to get all the kills. So I would like literally empty my coworker's gun and let all the bullets fall out. And he'd be like, Shh, sh, why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? And I'd be like, yeah. I actually stole your ammo. I stole his loot. I would steal all my like coworkers loot and coworkers. What the fuck is it called? Soldier sisters. I don't. Number three. I I get jump scared really easily. Okay, like if somebody comes up behind me, I'm I'm freaking the f out and accidentally popping them in the head. Like I truly would go to jail for friendly fire. So, like I said, I'm sitting this one out. Maybe don't invite me to the next war. Okay, y'all don't want me there, trust. I think we finally found a point of agreement with TikTok. We don't want this dude or the other TikTokers like him heading to the front lines if our country's security is at stake. <laughs> You can stay home and play Fortnite, all right? The other reason, and I don't even mean this in a negative way, I'm just like pointing out factually that many of these TikTokers don't need to be worried about being drafted or recruited to the military or anything like that, is that you're not allowed to join the military if you have a mental illness or if you take mental illness medication. So that would rule out most of these TikTokers. And I'm not even saying that with shade. That would rule me out too, right? I take medication for anxiety. I'm not shaming them. I'm just pointing out they're literally not eligible, so they don't need to freak out. Obviously, this guy is just joking around and it's all, you know, a skit like tongue in cheek. But a lot of the content on there about this is actually like intended seriously. Like young people are scared they're going to have to go to war. And that is just not justified by the facts at this point. And, and uh, like I said... Most of them are probably ineligible for different reasons. But what do you think? Do you think we would be doomed if we had to rely on Gen Z to save us? <laughs> and do you have any appreciation for the sense of humor that people have on TikTok? Because I know I dunk on the app all the time and the crazy ideas and the nonsense that people are saying, but there's a lot of creativity and humor on there that
that I honestly really appreciate. So I want to spotlight and highlight some of that too. If you got a kick out of that, don't forget to hit the like button and comment with your thoughts and make sure you're subscribed. Now, before we wrap up today's show and take a break for the weekend, I want to read a couple of your comments from the last episode. Somebody commented, your pictures are so dramatic. Close your mouth. <laughs> I think this is referring to my thumbnails and I do know like I do very dramatic expressions for them, but it's what works. Like we look at the data, YouTubers, right? We look at our click through rates. It, it's what works. So babe, the problem is you. It's the public. One person commented, free speech is absolutely essential as long as it doesn't go against my personal opinion. This is obviously meant sarcastically, but unfortunately it seems to describe the way that a lot of people on both the left and the right approach the free speech issue. Another person commented and said, please tell me you're not defending anti-Semitism under the guise of free speech. All right, well, I want to address this because this is something I hear a lot when I actually stick my neck out and defend free speech. Defending somebody's free speech does not mean you agree with them. It doesn't mean you're defending the merits of what they have to say. You're just defending their right to say it. I defend the rights of anti-gay extremists to speak, and I most certainly don't agree with them. So agree or disagree with me about the free speech question, but please do not ever misinterpret me defending someone's right to say something with an endorsement of what they said. Those are two very different things, and that is not a fair assumption to make. I don't know how to explain it, but you look like a third grade boy who plays soccer in this episode. I was wearing a USA soccer shirt, but I don't know how I looked like a third grade boy. Not sure I love that, to be honest, but all right, you're entitled to your opinion. And I'll leave it there for comments for today. Drop one in the comments and I'll consider reading it on tomorrow's show. And don't forget to hit that like button and make sure you're subscribed. With that, thank you all so much for joining me and I'll talk to you all on Monday.